so first of all, we have Just Nussbaum. Is that, I pronounced that correctly? I don't know. Um, and it's building a SAS module for Svelte Kit. Um, I won't read all of the, I'll let, I'll let Josh do that bit. Um, and then after that, we have James Calimeri. All right, I did, I did well. Um, Svelte in Motion, so that's the second talk. Yes. Right, so, yeah, awesome. Right, so thank you. What well, I guess a couple of last words is uh, thank you to Nico for doing the slides because I didn't. So um, <laughs> thanks for stepping in with the slides there, Nico. Um, and uh, we didn't mention toilets. Uh, is that door sorted? Yes, yes. Um, okay. So we need to go to the toilet. Please find one of us um, to take you there. <laughs> it is real annoying um, uh, because we have to use our cards to let you in and out. Um, we, I mean, we were told that they're going to be free for you to travel back and forth, but it hasn't been done so, so I do apologize. Just grab one of us and we'll escort you to the toilet and back. Actually, you know, uh, probably, uh, I mean, I need to go back a couple of months, like just to give a brief introduction about um, public Sipian. Oh. Um, I mean, I was hoping to have one of the management to come here and talk today, but they'll kind of like, you know, um, decided not to attend eventually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, who are we? We are pretty much an arm of Publicis Group Head. Uh, Publicis Sapien is our name. We are a digital agency and, you know, we are support different clients across the banking, um, retail, um, what other stuff do we have? Consumer services. Um, oh yeah, automobile, automobile services. Um, yeah, we have different clients that we assist with um, our uh, engineers, our kind of like technical team. Um, at the moment, we I don't think we are hiring. I, I'm really sorry about that. Um, as we're transforming to the new AI era, um, but soon we'll definitely be opening up positions for people to join. Um, and we also have a graduate scheme that runs at the beginning, I mean, runs once a year for um, uh, new joiners to join our company and scale them up from scratch. And yeah. I think that's pretty much it. Cool. cool. Yeah. Okay, let's get Josh on. Josh, are you around? Yes. yes. All right. Cool, you can show your screen now. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. It went. Would you be okay to take uh, Q&A after you finished? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. This is okay. Yeah, it looks like I'm coming through. All right, everybody. So uh, my talk tonight is, uh, is about uh, building a SaaS module uh, for for Svelte Kit. Um, just give you a brief about me. Uh, I am a software developer in uh, Montreal, Canada. Um, I I've been coding for a very long time. Uh, I used to work at Shopify, actually. That's how, kind of how I ended up in Svelte, is that um, when I was at Shopify, we were doing like a uh, React project for uh, like payment. It was like an accelerated checkout thing. And I do, it, I remember that it was like a bit tough, you know, like to work with React. So like when I ended up a couple of years later seeing Svelte, I was like, hey, you know, this is, this is like way easier. And uh, basically haven't touched React since. Um, I do a couple of uh, Svelte projects, so if you want to check them out, uh, I have a project for Stripe, uh, for uh, Stripe Elements, um, so a persistent store, and I also did a project that, like, um, is a comparison between React and Svelte, if you want to see, like, side-by-side -side, uh, code examples. Um, so, uh, this, this talk is basically about um, how to create... Uh, a payment and authentication setup in in Svelte Kit, uh, the easy way, hopefully. Uh, I divided it into like three parts, basically. Like first, like why I I did this, which is probably not very. There's not much Svelte content there. Just more like a business uh, a business problem that I encountered and how I how I tried to solve it. Then I go into like the what of like how I actually tried to solve that, and then lastly, I'm going to try to give you guys like a bit of a of in-depth of like what I learned about the projects that I was using, just so in case anybody here isn't doing SaaS stuff, they could probably still benefit from uh, what I learned about those code bases. Um, okay, so first, why I did this. So back in, I think it was in 21, 2021, 
I was trying to build this like uh, startup uh, little SaaS project, which is called Carrier Wave. And I used uh, Svelte. This is actually before Svelte Kit was 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 out there. So I was using uh, Svelte for the front end. Um, and the idea was that it was like a way for like people that are shipping a lot of products. Like let's say you're a merchant, you're shipping like a thousand boxes a day. Um, you need some way to like know that there's a problem with like only maybe out of the thousand boxes you ship, there's like two boxes that have an issue. Maybe the person wasn't, uh, the address was wrong or something. So it was a way of like kind of like giving alerts uh, and warnings to the merchant about about issues. Um, and it was cool. Like in the, in the fact that, you know, like I got some customers using it. I think it reached to maybe a couple grand a month, which was like amazing, you know, for first uh, attempt at SaaS. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, with any project you're going to have, uh, it's not perfect. In the end, it kind of, uh, it, I guess it kind of failed, but um, I, I like this. I don't know if you ever, I'm sure you're familiar with the saying, like winner, win or lose. I like the alternative uh, win or learn. So that's sort of how I ended up with this project was I was looking at, you know, can I mine this thing and try to find like uh, some useful things that I could take out of it to use for my next thing. And um, one of the issues uh, that I had, which is, I know it's kind of ironic because I'm like literally creating payment stuff is I, I, when I launched, I actually didn't have payment. Uh, the reason, my reasoning was uh, incorrect, but like I um, I figured that since I know payment stuff, like it's not really an unknown. So like I'll, I'll limp, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do that later and I'll try to, you know, focus my energy on the other stuff. Um, I, I think it was a mistake just because like, I think for a SaaS to work, like you basically have an engine and like an iteration of the engine is that a customer paid money for the thing used it and then pay it again and that's like an iteration so if you don't if you don't have the payment in there you're kind of not really proving the idea because you end up with like a lot of freeloaders people that are going to pay they, they claim they're going to pay the invoice later and they haven't got around to it and like and then you know then i'm basically a collection agency so i think that that was um a, a bit of a bit of a mistake i wish that you know i would prefer to have people not uh to like to not sign up and give you a reason like okay i'm not putting my credit card in because of x then you can go and solve that problem right as opposed to have them use it for free and then find out later that you know they're, they're just not paying for it so that's sort of how i got to this project um was so i looked at some alternatives like what are the what are you know what are the different ways you could you could solve this obviously you can go and just build it yourself that's probably the most common it's not rocket science it takes maybe a week or two depending on the quality level like for me i i want it to be high quality i probably need unit tests i need integration tests so it's quite a bit you know it probably it's going to take a, a week for sure to, to to you know to wire up your authentication and your payment together um there's obviously starters as well i see a lot of starters like uh next js tailwind like uh, like all you know everything in you know, one giant thing i i don't really like starters because i feel like you're you're just switching the problem like instead of uh solving authentication and payment now i have this new code base that i gotta now go learn and uh, you know uh and it has all these decisions made and then maybe i like vanilla js they like tailwind or i like supper base they like uh, surreal db and, like it's very hard to match all these all these choices and besides learning the whole code base, then it's impossible to also um, upgrade the, the the code base. You know, like if you make changes, you can't take an update from them anymore because it's not a library, right? So that's why I don't really like I don't really like to use starters if I can avoid them. Um, another option that's out there not used as much is, is APIs. So uh, there's like Memberful. There's a few of these companies where. Unfortunately, they will own your data. So it's you're really getting married to them if you're doing this. Like you're, you know, you're gonna be paying every month and your your bill is, is going up every month if you're successful. So for me, I mean, you know, if you're like a small indie hacker, I, I mean, I don't think you want to start your business by having a heavy subscription with somebody, right? Um and then of course there's the option that I took, uh, which I don't recommend, which is like just uh, pushing it off and thinking you'll do it later. But uh, definitely I would avoid that. Yeah. Okay, so that basically led me to this point of like, is there another way? How could we solve this? How could we make it easier? And so what I built is this thing called uh, AirBatch. And uh, I just want to say thank you to, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys know Didier uh, Lennon. He's in, he's, he's, or Didier Katz. He, 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 he did the logo for me. Thank you, Didier. Um, basically what AirBatch is, it's, this, it's, it's like the glue between Auth.js and Stripe. 
So it connects Off.js with Stripe and it allows you to essentially have a paywall on your site that is updated uh, based on the status of the person's payment. The cool thing is it's like ultra fast to set up. I was just setting it up for the doc site the other day. It's like, honestly, it's, it's minutes. Like the, the work now is in like, there's more work in probably going to, to like Google and figuring out how to, how to get your auth, OAuth credentials. Um, it's a library. So you don't, you don't, it's not a starter. It's not an API. It solves like, if you don't have any of those, any of those issues, if there's a new version comes out, you just update the NPM package and you're good to go. Uh, it's totally open source. So, you know, you see the code, you can modify the code. Um, it's, it's free. And I will, I'm, I, I would like to have a payment, a paid, a higher tier. And I'll talk about that later in the talk, but at least there should be like a very generous tier that anybody should be able to use it, you know, to get started. And yeah, the main thing is less code, right? Like, uh, who wants to write this code? If you can just get, if you can just focus on the app that you're building and the features you're trying to provide your customer and not have to write all that glue stuff, you know, that's like not interesting. Um, I think that would be a huge win. Um, I also like the fact that there's less, like it's, it's a library that's tested. So I'm not writing all this like integration tests with playwright and, and V test unit tests. Like I'm just getting something that's well tested. Um, I also like, you know, working in payments a lot. I, I find that it's like it, it attracts uh, payment. Billing code always seems to like attract problems because people are very like hesitant to change it because it's like, you know, it's real, that's how the business is making money. So they're not, they're not, they're not, you know, going to, people are, are, are reluctant to make, to modify it. So I think it would be better if you could just use somebody else's library that's like well-tested that, you know, uh, you could just bring it in. Um and this hopefully would make experimenting easier. So now instead of uh, every project starting out with a week or two of, of this this glue stuff, you can just go right into your experiment and you can have your thing up, you know, hopefully in a weekend, you know? Uh, so that's that's the hope. So I'll show you what it looks like to set this thing up. Uh, so it's just an NPM package which you install. It's Air Badge installed kit. Um, and once you have that installed, you go into your your hooks, right? And you you... I don't know if you guys have used Off.js. If anybody there has used it, I can't really see the crowd, so I can't ask you if, how many have used Off.js. But this should look very similar to if you've used Off.js because it looks almost identical. The only difference is that I've imported from Error Badge Salt Kit instead of from Off.js Salt Kit. So the API is very similar. Um, and like, imagine if you were, you can use any database you want, but like, imagine if you were using Prisma. The only difference you would have to do is you would add in a few extra columns to your table just so it can track the subscription status and the subscription ID. Uh, once you do that, you use a regular adapter. So Off.js basically supports tons of adapters, Prisma, Drizzle, Mongo, and you can use uh, like the out-of-the-box version. Uh, with Mongo, it's even easier because you don't even have to modify your schema. Like it'll it automatically will add the columns as needed. Um, and then, then you go in and set up the OAuth. Again, this is exactly the same as as Next Auth. You just choose, you know, Next Auth. I think it supports like a hundred OAuth providers. Um, so use any of those. Here I'm using Google Apple. And then um, the only so the only difference here now where we where we uh, are slightly different than AuthJS is that you want to create your pricing. So I like to use the CLI. You could use the dashboard, but the Stripe CLI works really well. You can just say like Stripe prices create, give it a name of the product currency amount sorry i should have uh, used pounds and um and the interval and that gives you a price id and so the price id then you you pass so this is an extra thing now you pass to your your auth uh, handler and you tell it basically um ids and prices and the reason that there's an id here is because you probably in your code you might want to have an if condition that says like if the plan id is basic do this if it's pro do that right so that's what the id does um now, once you do that, you get this basically, which is on the left-hand side, that's provided by Auth.js, which is a sign-in form. On the right-hand side is provided by Air Badge slash billing checkout. So when the user signs in, they're going to automatically be set into a checkout flow where they're where they're required to pay. Um, the cool thing also is, is that I, I check if the price is zero, like if it's a free price, if you have a free plan, or if, the, uh, if there's a trial, it'll skip the checkout. So it'll still create a subscription on Stripe, but you won't have to have the user fill out any forms, uh, which is nice. And it also handles all the webhooks for you. So all you do is you just go to Stripe Listen and you can forward it to your to your local host uh, 
and it has this building webhooks basically that will handle all the webhooks for you. So if you go to Stripe dashboard and you change the subscription to say it's canceled, it'll automatically be reflected immediately in the in the database. Um, it also uh, it adjusts the AuthGIS session. It adds like some extra stuff in the session. So there's now a subscription field in the session, which you can use to check the plan or the status. And this way you can have conditional logic. Um, yeah, here's an example. Like the, the stuff in gray is, is in the session is the session data provided by AuthJS. And the stuff in purple is the stuff that's uh, extra stuff that was added by AirBatch. So you see you can you know put your conditionals based on this. Um because I think authorization is very common, you know, like blocking uh, logic or preventing based on the status or, of the plan, I created a bunch of helpers. So you could basically import these helpers, which are like, they're kind of like middlewares. And there's one for each stat, uh, each subscription status. So you can say like subscriber.active, subscriber unpaid. So you could have your endpoints um, be disabled or blocked based on the status or the, or the plan. There's also one called plan. You could say subscriber.plan. And then specify only for like the pro plan. Only the pro plan can access this this endpoint. Um, and there's a very similar idea, but for the front for as as a, as components. So if it's not a server side condition, you can use this component uh, which has a slot. And so you can basically say like, oh, if they're trialing, okay, then show this message. You know. So this is nice. Like, you know, imagine a banner that says whatever you haven't paid your your you need to update your credit card. So you could basically just say uh, subscriber and then change the status here to be uh, whatever, unpaid. And then you can have your, your custom message for those people. So that's just a nice a nice component. All right, so now I'll uh, go maybe a little deeper into the uh, into the implementation of how, how I did this. I mean, obviously it's based on AuthJS and I tried very hard to keep it like exactly the same API as much as possible. Um, AuthJS basically is just a collection of some data um, in your database. In your table, uh, just a heads up, the account table here. Um, it, it, I don't know, me. It, it's I don't know. It's, I feel like it's oddly named. It's like um, it, basically the account is like one record per uh, provider. So like imagine if you have a, a Google account and an Apple account. You would have uh, one user uh, record, but you would have like two records in the account table. So it's not it's not like an account with multiple users, which well, that's how I would do it. I don't know, but anyways, um, yeah. So that's the schema. And then when you in AuthJS, they they call it uh, an adapter. Uh, again, I, I find that weirdly named because I feel like everything there is an adapter. There's database adapters and authentication adapters. But anyways, adapter means really database adapter, and you can create your own. But like you just have to implement this API, and so like each of them, like the Drizzle one, the Frizzle, the Mongo, they all have these functions, and yeah, so it's pretty straightforward if you want to add a new one. And in my in my case, like I'm using, I'm just piggybacking off their their interface, to like update the user. So like, let's say a webhook comes from Stripe with a change the status of the subscription changed, I just call update user on that on that user to to change the change the fields of the table. Um, the other thing that AuthJS has is providers. So this is this is basically my spec. Um, that it uh, it supports like tons and tons of stuff, tons of OAuth providers, tons of password options, even like password lists or pass with password. Like now they're even doing web auth then. I haven't really looked at it yet, but it looks like they're supporting that. So there's lots of options, and also custom. You could if you have a custom OAuth uh, situation, you can just define uh, define the endpoints in there, which is nice. It's actually using uh, this thing, which I've never encountered mm -hmm. until I was looking at off on chest. But this is basically the the project that uh, the npm package that provides the OAuth stuff. Um, and so all another thing that AuthJS does is it, it gives you like all these like uh, useful endpoints. We I think we saw this one, the auth sign in. That's where it would show like a sign in form or sign in buttons. Um, it also provides like a sign in provider so like if you want to send the user directly to google or directly to apple you just say slash sign in slash apple let's say and that will take them directly to that to that flow and um, if you want to sign out you could post to this this endpoint and sign the user out um if you want to like also this uh, auth providers is useful it's like a json um 
it's a JSON payload that has all the active providers. So like, imagine you wanted to build like a pop-up UI for the, you're signing in. You could just, data, you could fetch this endpoint. It'll give you a JSON of all the providers and then you could data bind your UI. And so you could show buttons, Google, Apple, whatever's, whatever's enabled. Um, they also let you in AuthJS uh, uh, customize pages. So like, if you don't like the AuthJS sign-in page, you can just change it to be something else. Um, another one I change a lot is this new user, like essentially the page that the, the, they send the user to after they uh, sign up. Like I would, I would usually like change it to like uh, slash welcome or something like a welcome page or dashboard. So that's a, a useful one to change. Um, and they also uh, they also provide like a lot of um, ability to to configure to and make changes. Like for example, you can. These are almost like hooks where you could hook into the to different events that are happening inside um, AuthJS and you could change the behavior. Like you could, for example, sign in, they'll call that when somebody signs in and you could say like, you could return false for some reason, like, no, this user is blocked. Uh, you could change like how their, what URLs they're redirected to and stuff like that. Or you could change the session, like add extra data to the session, do a database lookup or something. This is kind of very, very useful. Um, this is what makes this whole thing possible. Is, is me basically modifying the callbacks. Um, yeah, I'll also talk about a little bit the what a Stripe integration looks like with SvelteKit. So usually there's there's two ways of doing it. Um, there's either, either you can think of either checkout, which is like a hosted version, you know, where you basically just use Stripe for their, U, the Stripe will manage the UI for you. And then there's the elements, which is more like an embedded, you know, if you, if you want to embed something into the page, uh, for the elements, definitely check out, uh, this is my project, Style Stripe. Uh, that's the doc site. Um, it has a lot of, it has basically all the Stripe widgets. So if you want to have, let's, let's say you wanted to have an Apple Pay button, there's a, there's a component that you can just drop on your, anywhere in your page and you know, it'll, it'll support Apple Pay or Google Pay or whatever. So that's kind of useful if, you, if, you, if you're doing payment stuff. But like, I feel like for this thing, I just use the hosted checkout because I feel like I was kind of thinking in for the terms of like an indie developer, like you want to get your project out this week, this weekend, let's say, um, you probably are fine with having it hosted. You just want to get paid and like, you know, you'll develop your idea in the future. Maybe you'll have a fancier payment form. So usually with Stripe, that means you would call a uh, checkout sessions, create and this, and this is basically how you would start a checkout session. You give it a bunch of uh, URLs, like where to go on success, on failure, what the currency is and the light items. In this case, that would be like the plant, the pricing that we set up earlier. So I pass the missing IDs and then you redirect the user to the, to that, to the checkout URL. So this is implemented for you already in, in error badge. You don't have to do it yourself or any of the tests or anything. Um, I, I kind of tried to use, you know, like those, uh, I think I don't know if they're called like babushka dolls or Russian dolls sometimes. But like, you know, where like, it's like fit, fit, you know, like there's a doll inside the doll. That's sort of what I would try to do with the AuthJS thing where it's like this API is all of, it's just AuthJS plus one extra config option called plans. That's it. So it's very uh, easy to get, to get rolling with. Um, and it's, and it reuses all their stuff. So I, I'm not, I don't have to invent the, reinvent the wheel. I can reuse the AuthJS adapters, provide it and versatile, you know, obviously they're putting a lot of effort and energy into this. So, you know, essentially using, using that. Um, it, what I do is inside the callbacks, I modify uh, callbacks so that I set the assumption subscription. That's and that basically I do a database lookup here and, and fill that out, and then I also override the redirection to basically say if they need payment, then I I send them to that that new endpoint that I uh, that that I've that I've created going checkout. Good. And so you remember how AuthJS has like a a auth slash auth endpoints. What I did was I, I, I was like, hey, that's a great idea. I should do the same for billing. So that's what I did. Basically, there's a billing checkout. That's 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 what initiates the checkout. And you could pass in the plan if you wanted to as well. Optional. Um, if you want to send the user to the to the billing portal, that's like a UI that Stripe provides where you can, where the user can like self, uh, can cancel their account or change, update their credit card. So that you just send them like it just you would literally just need an A tag with the href to that and you know that and that. I also have this nice handy endpoint called modify, which would allow you to change the plan. So imagine like you have on your site a little banner that says like, oh sorry, this feature is not available, upgrade to the pro plan. 
the link the link to upgrade it could just be going to modify plan equals pro and that's it bad they're, they're updated to the pro plan same with cancel um i also stole off js's idea of provider json I, instead i'm using plans here so if you let's say you have a pricing page and you want to show a list of pricing you could just fetch this endpoint the pricing plans and you'll get a json of all the plans that are configured and you know you can just data bind to ui and of course the billy webhooks that that's handling all the stripe webhooks for you so yeah so that's that's the endpoints yeah the other thing i was thinking about is like monetization i mean i, I haven't done anything here now like I, my idea was that like have a very generous free option that anybody could use to get started with but i think something like this it would be good to like i know if i was you know i'm a user i would want it to be maintained um especially something like this where you know businesses could rely, will rely on it um one idea i had is is maybe to use a bsl license i know it's not used that much but um i think it's catching some steam i know there, there's like some companies for example like maria db hashi corp century um, they're using it, you know, like Sentry, you can host Sentry your own, uh, on your own server, um, or you could pay and have, you know, have them handle it for you. So I was like trying to figure out like, what's a good point? Like at what moment should somebody be okay with paying for it, you know? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I was thinking about it. I think one one, uh, one place maybe, or, or a few features that I'm thinking about maybe building as a, as a paid thing, you know, maybe like $200 a year or something like that. Uh, would be like team pricing. So like, imagine you want to have multiple users under one subscription. Cause I feel like at that point, like if somebody is successful with the pro with the thing and they're, they're going into like now selling team licensing, they're probably relying on this. Like they, they, they wouldn't mind to pay for it. Same with annual pricing. You know, like most people don't start with offering annual pricing. It's more like once they're more successful, they go, oh, well, let's, we can make more money if we, uh, right. If we charge annual. So then, all right. So then, you know, yeah, then then you're willing to invest. Same with per seat. I find like a lot of uh, B2B, they, uh, they want to charge for the seat. So if you're charging for seats, you're probably you're probably already, you know, on your way. I don't know. Yeah, so I guess in summary, um, what I would say is I'm not sure what's next for this. Like, I'm, I'm going to use it. Um, I could, uh, one way I can go with this is like, maybe obviously it's built on uh, AuthJS. It could it could be also used in React, maybe as a next next JS project. I don't know. Um, I, I like you know, for example, I see Lucia off. They're 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 doing that. Maybe maybe this could also work work for this project. Um, I could also look at other frameworks like Auth, uh, other uh, sorry other authentication systems like Auth0, Suffabase, Lucia, etc., and try to do this a similar maybe like an adapter for that. So if, if people have different auth options, that could be an option too. Um, and obviously will work i i mean you know with any any idea you kind of just put it out there you see if it if it if it helps people and based on that you know you could put more energy into it i know i'm going to use it i'm going to try it i think it's going to help me experiment so i guess you know at least i have that and uh yeah i mean that's it thank you so uh yeah just uh, thank you scott for setting it up thank you uh to your sponsors and thank you so much and I'll take any questions if you have. Uh, and uh, here's some, oh, by the way, yeah, check out the links. Um, I don't have a landing page up yet. It's just the logo, but the doc site is up. So if you want to take a look at the docs, the code is not public yet, but uh, yeah, it'll it'll be in the next few days. Check, check out Josh's courses as well, uh, podia.com. Sorry, use the mic. Yeah, um, Josh, you've got two on there now. I know. The first one I saw was an insta buy for me. Uh, some really good stuff in there. Um, you've got another one now, right? Um, yeah, there's a privilege. Sure what the, what, what's the other one you got? So, do, what are the then two courses? This, uh, I have one on uh, Svelte Kit SaaS, and then I have one on Prisma. That's about. Uh, I, think, I think I looked at the Prisma one. Um, have you got your Twitter so people can check you out on there? Cause oh, yeah, it's uh, is, I'm not uh, Josh News. I'm Josh News on all um, the yeah. things. Uh, there you go, yeah. Yeah, because this is how I come across this just from, I mean, I know not a lot of people who still on Twitter so much, but this is how I come across this and uh, uh, I thought it was a great idea to share. But um, yeah, thank you. I, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, Anthony? Yeah, so we have questions. I just want to say you haven't got a landing page. That's great. You've launched the right time. <laughs> that, is, that is good work. Um, right, yes. So, so questions, any questions? 
Thank you. Um, so you've built it in a pretty modular way. Um, is that to yes. say that if I were to if I were, were to adopt it, um, it would be bring your own internationalization, bring your own X, bring your own Y. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I guess there's no there was no assumption on the there's very little assumption on the UI. So the, actually, the components that I provided are are they're actually uh, they're headless really because it's really just like a s slotted component. So there's no real text or I guess it would really be up to what Stripe settings are for internal initialization, like being able to have a country specific checkout. I think I believe that they have that. You can, the language could be adjusted. I think. Sure. Thank you. Great answer. That's uh, all, all it's added to uh, Josh's uh, to do list. <laughs> <laughs> now they're going to be now. <laughs> I'm going to want to. You can also put them here because they can see your face if you stand in front of that camera, but uh, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, great project. Uh, one question though why base it on OSJS and not like Lucia? And especially, I'm asking that because. OSJS was like split from next off and it's not greatly working with Spellkit. It, it does work, but it's it's so far in some aspects. Yet Lucia like at least was built from the ground up with a headless one and you know, with adapters for each sort of framework. Yeah, I mean um I think Lucia looks very good. I, I I haven't really looked at it that much. I guess the reason is probably my own familiarity with OSJS and maybe also like I, I felt like it, you know, first of all, is obviously behind this project. Um, yes, it is. I agree that like the state is sometimes funny a bit, like the internals of the code. If you look at it, it there's still a lot of like next JS stuff in there, which is odd, but I know that they're improving it. So I feel like uh, it's, it's worth betting on. Yeah. But I, but I, like I said, I am I am considering, you know, whether I should support other other frameworks. But if you look at the numbers, though, like if you go on npm and you look at how many downloads part of the project gets, right, it, it gets a massive amount of downloads. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Think there's room for, for many for many options. <laughs> but it, it'd be great to to support others as well. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, we we actually use AuthJS, and I wonder that myself. But actually, I looked at your your plan of following the infrastructure, and it's quite nice because they have all these mechanisms like adapters and stuff. Um, any more questions for Josh? Before I continue. I'll just talk about it. Did you did you get that? Okay. No idea. Any plans to support crypto? <laughs> It's not. I, really know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Explain it. Josh, does um, sorry, it's um, does. By the way, I think that crypto Josh, isn't it very hard to do subscriptions with crypto? I think it's like like supposedly impossible or something. I can't remember, right? Because because you can't. Yeah. The whole idea is it's anonymous, like payments. So like, how do you connect identity to that? Yeah, I'm not a crypto expert, so I don't know. I'm not in percent sure they were trolling, <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, uh, I've totally forgot my question there. Oh, uh, pass keys. So does AuthJS support pass keys? Do you know? And um, does it forward, sorry? To, um, pass keys. You know, like YubiKey, like like. Oh, what, pass keys. Um, um, yeah, like the Fido alliance. Is that web off end? Is pass keys web off end? I don't know. Who said yes? I think they might be. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yes. Okay. There you go. Web off end. Uh, just curious as to that. And a further to Boyan's question, um, I, I thought the way you were speaking about it um, for the provider was that you could essentially swap your own one in with the, the API routes you've got already. Yeah. Yeah. So do, do it yourself, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, cool. Um, I haven't got any questions other than that. I have one more. Um, you, yeah, crypto, you can't actually, you have to sign a transaction with an amount with your private key, so you can't subscribe. But I'm sure someone will solve yeah. it with some ridiculous yeah. solution at some point. Just... Um, so, okay. Uh, my question was only one thing, actually. I guess because you've got this, like, 
it's an abstraction over things. You're talking about different frameworks, you're talking about different providers. What about different payment providers? So my, for me, this library looks amazing actually, um, for the use case you've described, I would look to support something like, um, let's say Aiden or something. How could you go about that? Have you boxed yourself in or do you think there's a, a scope for that? No, I think it's possible. Uh, I, I think the same, uh, adapter approach can work. Totally. You know, it's, it's uh, right now, it's really just at the end of the day, the Stripe is thing is providing a URL. Uh, it maybe just needs to change the config a bit. Like it's one thing too, I haven't really added TypeScript, but that might be something that's needed there too, just to be able to handle a different configure. Like if you added Agin, then I, I think their data might be different. Like they don't have price IDs. They have some other thing, you know? Um, yeah, there's I think quite it could a few be Stripe specifics. Yeah. Okay. It could be done. This is an alpha, right? At the end of the day, this is an alpha. Yeah. And I have to put something out there and see like how people use it and and it's gonna change, right? It's definitely absolutely you know, B2 and then that will probably be more uh, more yeah, it'll probably be more polished then. So we'll Yeah, I think I think we've all railed you with the really hard questions here tonight. So, <laughs> so sorry and not no, no, sorry no, at the same time. Yeah, no, no problem, no problem. Cool. Uh right, we have talk number two. But he's facing the wrong way. Is his head on the right way around? I can't tell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're ready for James's talk now, which is going to be so in motion. So, first of all, thank you, James, for doing this talk. I was badgering him for literally three weeks to do this talk. So, um, thank you for putting the slides together for this and agreeing to do the talk. And uh, I can't wait. I mean, it looks really tantalizing. Procedural, procedurally. Procedure. Uh, generated videos using everyone's favorite framework and ungodly hackery. You're not getting it. Sounds very interesting. So I'm very keen for it to get started. So everyone give James a big round of applause and we'll get him started. Hello, everyone. Um, so, yes, this is basically a talk about a thing I hacked together in a weekend against my better judgment. Um, and yeah, it sounded cool, so I'm going to talk you through it. Um, hi, I'm James. Um, I vaguely remember what's in these slides, but I will look back to remind myself and then base my talk on what's in front of me. Uh, so yeah, I'm James. I'm from, I live in London now. I do software development, obviously, that's why I'm here. Uh, but I'm originally from Malta, and this is one of my favorite graphics to show. Uh, this is Greater London. And this is the entirety of my home nation. <laughs> uh, and that's like Woolwich over there, spreading up to Watford. That's the whole thing. Uh, but like if you cram us in a bit, there's like you can fit way more Maltas into London than expect. Um, so yeah, I do front-end development mostly. And I think the first time I ever coded a bit of HTML was on this thing called Neopets, which most people probably have never heard of, but some people have memories of some sort uh, how about, how about... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah hack together a storefront or a house for my pet cow who i've since lost access to which is very sad um and that was clearly a slippery slope because i'm still doing web dev like 15 years later um i'm also into graphic design so yeah i found this stellar gif uh and this is kind of a combination of those two interests of mine, code and graphic design and animation and suffering. <laughs> um, so uh, it's basically going to be about animation. Uh, this is a very reductive overview of animation as a concept for those of you who somehow aren't aware of it. Uh, there's lots of ways to do animation, the painful way, whereas you draw every single frame by hand over many, many hours, and then you put them all together very fast and you get movement. Um, and then computers came along and we found a way to do it slightly better. And you've got nifty things like Adobe Flash, usually <laughs> Macromedia Flash. Uh, and you've got these cool things called keyframes here. So you can like put a ball over here and keyframe it and then move your ball over here and keyframe it again. And the computer will sort out the middle. So that saves you like 40 frames of suffering. Um, uh, and now we tend to use a piece of software called Adobe After Effects, which besides doing all this thing, has added the nifty feature um, 
of actually adding JavaScript code directly into your animations. So why click and drag my little red ball when I can write some JavaScript to do that for me? Which is great when you need to do complex animations, great when you need to do like things tracking one another, um, or great if you just like coding for fun, if you're that kind of oriented person. Um, but this talk is about what if we just skip all the software and bits in the middle and just write the video directly with code. So like leave out Flash, leave out the hand drawing, leave out After Effects. JavaScript straight to video. Um, so that's what this is about. And the end result of, again, this hacks and plagiary is an actual video file that you can share on social media or like mail to your mother or whatever you do with the videos you receive on the internet. Uh, this already exists. So like as a concept, this is something called remotion. Um, pretty handy. You basically can use React to generate front-end code, and that can get composited into a video. So this is cool, but um, yeah, I didn't... <laughs> <laughs> wrong audience. So I had a project I had to deal with, um, like generate a bunch of title slides for like a banking conference or something. Um, and I thought, this is miserable to do by hand. Can we code it? And I found out, yes, you can um, with this thing. Uh, but it's React. And mm. uh, <laughs> so I could either use something that someone else built and sleep, or else I could recode the entire thing in Svelte just so I get to use Svelte. And that's basically what I did. So uh, this is about creating a similar sort of concept um, from the ground up in Svelte. So I'll show you why I built that, how I built that, and like all the nifty tricks that made it again clutch together. Yeah. Disclaimer, important disclaimer, especially compared to all the usual talks we have here. This is not a product, this is not a library. Like you can't just download this and magically get on your way. This is just this collection of hacks I squashed together. It's on GitHub now, you can see it, but um, there is no support team. It's not ready for production. You have been warned. Um, but yeah, important question before I go down the rabbit hole. Why? Why would anyone um, ignore software that's been built for decades specifically for animation and choose to do everything through JavaScript? Um, a, again, you like suffering. Uh, but B, uh, there are scenarios where this actually comes in handy. Something like Spotify Wrap. So Spotify Wrap generates a unique video for every single user. Um, doing that by hand is a massive bitch. Uh, so if you could find a way to automate that, feed in user data and actually spit out unique videos for each user, for each data point, uh, that actually comes in kind of handy. And that is specifically what this project uh, aims to solve. Main problems we have to deal with with generating video through a browser. How do we actually get the animation out of the browser in the first place, like they're not built obviously to create video, very much not the point. How do we make it deterministic? So every time I run this video, I want it to work the same way. I like I needed to render stably and sensibly and reliably. Um, and finally, how do I get an actual MP4 at the end of it, which I can pipe into whatever other form of internet transfer I'm using. I will go through these one by one. You trust me. How do I get the animation of the browser? Playwright. Is it a testing tool? Yes. Is it built for squashing video out of your browser? Definitely not. Can you do it? Yes, you can. By God, you can. Um, so this was actually pretty easy. Um, Playwright has this lovely page dot screenshot. Uh, you could also probably do it directly through a headless browser, Chrome. I'm sure it has some sort of API as well. I just took the easy route and use the well-documented Playwright system. Uh, dead simple. Grab your frames, set your viewport, browser size, load your page. So every individual uh, unique web page is a frame of your video. Take a screenshot of it. Done, off the web. Um, some of you are thinking Playwright can just record video. You know that, right? You did not sleep for three days to do this and not record the video. Um, I do know Playwright has video recording. Uh, however, quality, 
not great. It's obviously not geared towards production level video. Uh, you can't pause a render halfway through. If you're rendering, I don't know, a couple of minutes, 60 frames per second, it gets pretty hefty. You might want to stop, tweak, adjust, and continue rendering later. You can't do that if you're just recording an MP4 directly from your browser. Um, if something goes wrong, which it does all the time, you need to start your render all over again. Um, and also really nifty with taking individual screenshots is that you can parallelize the whole thing. So you could have different machines rendering different bits of your video. You could have the same machine rendering six frames at a time. Super cool. Um, and again, you couldn't do if you're just recording video directly out of your browser. So decided to use this technique and take individual shots of every frame. So problem one solved. Problem two, how to make it deterministic. So basically what we're saying is every time I play this video, I want it to look the same, which is not usually the case with browsers because you've got strange lag, you're trying to run 4K at 60 FPS and Slack opened up. So your memory usage went to hell. Um, not great. So there's loads of unknowns. How can we erase as many of those unknowns as possible and just make sure the thing looks right every time? Um, and this is a fantastic bodge and lots of cheating. And the issue is basically all the system clocks. So JavaScript is running on an internal clock, but remarkably, you can just fake that out. You can completely swap out the clock and make it tick whenever you want. So we use fake timers. Um, again, these are mostly used for testing because if I need to test that a certain process runs at 6 a.m. GMT, I do not want to wake up and run my tests at 6 a.m. GNT, so I fake the timers, and most of JavaScript's internal timers hook onto this system, basically. So your request animation frame, your set timeout, your set intervals, um, all that can be swapped out and faked, and you can set an exact time code you want the, Java subs the JavaScript subsystem to run on. So um, in a nutshell here, when we're on render mode, stick in our fake timers. Um, and if we're not on render mode, because we actually want to preview the video in real time, uh, remove the fake timers. And then we can literally force through a direct frame, calculate our frame rate, and set the clock to that exact time. So if, for example, I have an animation that's 10 seconds long, um, I know I want to render frame six, put that frame into the URL, kick up my fake timers, and force the time to be a frame rate calculation. I don't want to do mental math in front of you all. It'll go awfully wrong. Um, but, you know, FPS, frames per second, do the maths. That's what the computer's for. Um, so, yeah. Simple. Um, the good stuff is it'll be the same every time you want frame 12, you will render frame 12. Everything will look as it should for frame 12. That's nice, consistent renders. Um, you don't have the weirdness with lagginess. I'm not sure that's a word. I'm even less sure that's how you spell it, but lag as a general concept is a problem. Browsers being flaky. As I mentioned before, this means you can render subsets of the animation. So I only want to render the first half, just put those frames in. Uh, I want to double time and do a rough sample render. I can render every other frame. Um, I don't have any of this flexibility if I'm recording directly or if I'm using the system clock. So this lets me choose exactly what I want to show. Um, again, easily adjust the frame rate, let the computer do the maths. And again, you can also parallelize because each browser instance is showing a single frame. Um, so you can spin up as many browser instances as you want and show as many individual frames as you want at the same time. Two problems solved. The problem of why would you do this madness in the first place will never be solved. Um, finally, how do I actually turn those frames into a video file? Easy peasy, FFmpeg. A piece. superb piece of software. It does everything and more. Um, the hardest part is figuring out which of the bajillion command line arguments you need to grab your things and squash them into a video. But I have done that for you. Um, <laughs> these are the command line arguments you need. 
give it a frame rate, tell it where the frames are, give it an audio file if you want. You can even offset the audio if your client decides halfway through the process that they'd like the audio to sound just a little bit later. Um, easy peasy. And you can even render uh, videos with a transparent background as an MOV file, as an MP4, um, a trace co uh, containers if you want, like everything. It does everything. Um, punch in those command line arguments, call it from Node.js, and boom, you now have a video file. And it only took you one weekend. <laughs> oh, great. We've solved the problems. But, but there's more. We can do data-driven video. Because by God, everything has to be data-driven in 2024. <laughs> um, this sounds crap, but it's actually pretty cool. So as I mentioned, something like title slides. I have... 50 people attending a banking conference. Everyone needs a title slide. I don't want to manually write a video for everyone. So I can just generate one video, feed in a list of parameters, and have it spit out a video for each one. I have somehow become a multi-million dollar music streaming conglomerate, and I want to give everyone a Spotify wrapped. Do I kill the intern, or do I find a way to do this automatically? Um, so this is one I did earlier, um, again, ripped off from previous clients. So like, I'm not going to mention their names for obvious reasons. Um, we're just passing the stuff straight in through the query parameters and the video will take that data and spit it out. Super easy. Um, close up of the browser URL bar, just in case the people at the back couldn't see it. Um, but this also gives us another interesting possibility. So what if I don't want every single video to look exactly the same? What if I want some pizzazz, some variation? Uh, we can do that too. So in this case, you'll see this is exactly the same code. I have changed nothing except the parameter going in to the title. You see I've been promoted. Uh, and so this is pretty much completely changed, maybe not completely changed, but um, created a completely different variation of the same video. The colors have changed, the size of the floating blob has changed, the colors of the particles at the background have changed, the angles of the things have changed. Um, all that is specifically dependent on the parameters going in to, uh, to the URL bar. Uh, obviously, you can't just use a math.random because math.random will give you a different random value every time, i.e. every frame. So your video will turn into a massive, fuzzy, corrupt disaster. Um, so to get that working, uh, we can use a pseudo-random generator, which is what JavaScript actually uses under the hood, except in this time, we can actually decide how those numbers are generated. So, um, quick aside, most of you know this, but a computer is not truly random. It uses a pseudo-random number generator to generate random numbers. That random number generator is given a seed, and that seed value is what dictates what random numbers come out. Uh, now, in most cases, if you want actual random numbers, you're picking up your seed from, I don't know, some random system variable. Um, there's a bit somewhere in the bowels of the DOS, they're like collecting entropy data. Um, in this case, we want the opposite of that. We want to we want to be sure that the random numbers are always going to come out the same, which sounds ridiculous, but it guarantees that when I render every frame of my video on a separate machine um, at separate times, each frame will always look the same. And so to do that, we've got our own little pseudo-random number generator. I have no idea what any of this does. <laughs> Not a clue. It looks really clever. There's a paper and everything. Uh, but basically what we're saying is we're pushing in a, a number for the seed, and that's going to return a random number generator. The random numbers generated from that function are going to be predictable. So if we look at this, I've generated three random number generators. These two have the same seed. This one does not. If I call random on each of them, you'll see that these random uh, numbers are identical, while this one has a completely separate seed is not. 
So this means if I'm using the random number generator to dictate, I don't know, the size of certain elements in the video, uh, the speed of an animation, the colors, um, every frame will have the same randomness. Uh, but also I can use it to tweak and adjust things according to that seed I put in. So if I just hash the name of the initial parameter, if I hash, I don't know, any kind of data that is unique for that video, I can use that to drive and generate a video file that is unique to that set of data. Um, add a comma, change someone's names, like the entire name would be completely different. Um, so now we do the demo slash walkthrough, um, which will probably work, but it's a live demo, so it may also probably not. <clears throat> oh, thank you. It's great. So um, first I'm going to show you the one I made earlier. So this is just... <laughs> So yeah, it does audio too. Um, again, that was totally generated in browser. Um, now if, let's say, so let's make one for Scott. So let's open, I want to move this here slightly because I can't see what I'm doing. Okay, so much. We should. Um, so let's go to our renderer, find our config. Um, and... We're gonna add Scott, and he's gonna be great mic holding guy. And <laughs> save that. You're doing such a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Um, should I turn down? Okay. Go there. The sound. Uh, um. um so if we pop in here it should have so this is my render sample uh, sorry my preview so if we put scott in here at some point i'll create an interface to like make this a bit less hacky but very low priority um this is not his real job so, so if I... <laughs> So as you can see, rendered on the fly, different colors, different alignment of things, data's in, um, and that was nifty and worked. Um, and now that we know it looks good enough, uh, we can get the thing rendered. So, spin that up, show PNPM render, will this work? Come on, buddy. Yes. If one of the colors is part of attention, it's great. Nothing like with dramatic effect. Um, so as you can see there, it's rendering six separate threads. Um, and those are the frames of Scott's video being generated. So it starts with a black white, which is, so I see those are all popping out. You can see the name zooming in. The one thing this doesn't do is motion blur, which I haven't figured out yet. Like motion blur would be nice. I just probably need like um, SVG filters or whatnot. Um, it's pretty fast on the whole. Again, so these are multiple threads. Um, on my little laptop, um, Remotion, which again, heavily, heavily, heavily inspired this idea, um, put this onto Lambdas on AWS and you can just render at humongous scale. But if you have six laptops running around at home, you can just do that that way anyway. <laughs> um, this tends to take like a minute and a half, two minutes for a 10 second video, obviously increasing the resolution and increasing the frame rate will make it take slightly longer. Um, we don't need to wait for it to finish, but effectively, once that's done, it'll use FFmpeg to glue all the frames together and generate a little video. Um, cool. 
So what I also thought I'd do is walk through um, like the most important bits of the source code. I planned ahead and marked all the important bits. So I don't have to go faffing around my file directory. Uh, I'm just going to point them out basically. So uh, this is just... Wait, how do you mark them? I just put a comment on and I have a VS Code plugin that marks my to-do is in bright orange. So I can still ignore them, but at least know they're there in bright orange. <laughs> and I just updated it to also worry about Svelte Meetup. Um, so that's nifty. Um, so yeah, simple playwright config, nothing important. I'm just setting the compilation phase as global teardown. Uh, I think this might almost be done now. Yep, see, so now it's compiling those frames. That's the um, ffmpeg command. And we should have a video. <laughs> um, so yeah, playwright config. Only interesting thing to note here is that we're using this compilation as a global teardown. Um, if we look here, you'll see again the same sample of code I showed earlier. This is basically just running the Node.js ffmpeg command. We've got flags for the frame rate, um, the inputs, uh, whether we're offsetting the audio. We can choose different file types. You can go nuts here. It's, it's just ffmpeg. Um, da -da -da. Here's our config. So here you can see um, I'm feeding in the length of the entire video, the time to offset the audio by, resolution, frame rate. Um, deleting the frames and I'm done. Uh, you can just keep adding here. So it'll render all of those again in parallel and then combine them separately. Uh, each one will be slightly different because of that uh, like random number generator that procedure part. Um, this is just a stupid function that's used to generate configs for an individual test. Uh, this is all rude. Um, this is how we're rendering again, uh, showed the snippet earlier, spinning it up in playwright, running it as a test, which just feels wrong, but it works. Mm -hmm. Um, setting the viewport size, opening the URL, we're passing in the frame specifically through the URL, um, taking a screenshot and calling it a day. Uh, da -da 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 -da. so if we look at, so this is all running on Svelte uh, so file-based routing, there's basically one simple route here. The main layout is what is installing the fake timers. If um, we've got a render in the URL, if we don't have a render in the URL, it'll just play the full video so you can test while you're tweaking. Um, and then on the actual page itself, uh, we're just doing a lookup according to the URL itself to pull out the scene. So you can have multiple scenes and render them all at once, all from the same config. Um, so setting the scene over here is what drives uh, which of those scene files, which is just a Svelte component, uh, is going to get loaded and rendered. <clears throat> Again, um, if a frame is defined in the URL, load that frame particularly, set the clock to that frame, and call it a day. Uh, if not, it'll just play. Ta -da -da. These are our random number generators. Again, um, number generator here, simple hashing algorithm, as in simple as if I know what it's doing, I have no idea what it's doing. <laughs> but like the gist of it is put a string in, get a number out. Put a slightly different string in, get a completely different number out. So that means um, you can use uh, people's names, their titles, whatever you have in your video, their song choices, um, and you can get a unique number out of that and then use that to seed uh, your random number variables. And finally, this is actually how the animation was constructed. So just a plain ass uh, Svelte component, um, lots of subcomponents, which were the bubble on the side, the main wipe effect, the particles on the background, it's subcomponents all the way down. Um, these props are fed through the query parameters. Um, defaults are nice, 
So if you forget to set the query parameters, the whole thing doesn't blow up in your face when you're trying to test. Um, and this is the nifty bit where we are setting, uh, creating a specific random number generator that's unique to that combination of parameters. So for this name and this title, I will always get the same random numbers. Um, if in a scenario you have a weird conference where multiple people have the same name and the same title, uh, you're going to have to feed some of their data in to get different videos for them. Uh, I presume most of you are familiar with um, spelled spring stores and tween stores. Uh, so tweens and springs are a spelled specific mechanism for doing like bounce motion, uh, ease in and ease out. You basically feed as a number. Um, you can set how bouncy you want your number to change, how smoothly you want it to fade in and out. Um, and this is actually what drives most of the motion. So if we look at, I'm going to mute it so we stop hearing Tigger screaming. Um, if we look at this, you'll see that there's a little bit of a bounce on everything. Those things fade in kind of smoothly. That, that math, so like the sine wave and how everything looks, that's all that. Um, it's part of the inbuilt animation tooling. Uh, very cool. So that basically handles all of the, the magic motion. Uh, set timeout and set interval and request animation frame and so on. Those just work because we're taking over the internal JavaScript clock and patching it with individual frames and, and second timings. Um, and the styling is all CSS, just plain as CSS, CSS variables, which again, you can modify according to, to the hash. Um, so super easy to generate lots of variations. Yeah. And I think that's a wrap. Um, thank you. Wow. Um, Brene, any, any questions? Yeah. Oh, questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, 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 the shapes in the background are also procedurally driven. So the same hash function that is used for the animation is actually fixating the position and the rotation and the angle of those flying shapes in the back. So you'll see it's the same for each frame because it's based on the content of the frame itself. So the slides are made in that? The slides are all svelte and reveal JS. Again, to the views PowerPoint, but why? James, you um, mentioned before something about um, motion blur. Obviously, that's like a interpolation problem. And then you mentioned that you might uh, want to take it a next step and do something with SVG. Can you elucidate? It's really interesting. So, uh, to take that script notes. So, yeah, um, SVGs are really good to work with in Svelte. I've done loads of kind of actually the, this is all SVG except the 3D bits, which are um, threads. And the previous video I show, like the bubbles, the shapes, those are generally all SVGs. Um, it basically works as if you're manipulating the DOM um, and you can do lots of nifty reactive stuff with it. Uh, I mentioned SVGs in particular because there are filters that you can use on SVG to add things like Gaussian blur. And, and that is off the top of my head, the only way I can think of actually adding blur um, to the browser. I know there's some basic CSS that does kind of glass-like blur, but obviously websites were not built to include motion blur. It's not really a feature you want in your website. So kind of hacking in motion blur into something like this just to get slightly more naturalistic looking motion, uh, that will be an interesting problem to solve, I think, for the next weekend, I feel like mm -hmm. sleeping. <laughs> weekend of six. <laughs> Um, there's also uh, like there's also Wasm and WebGL. You can include all of that in this because it's just the browser. So worst case scenario, we'll just write a custom shader and never sleep again. <laughs> um, any more questions? Okay, so before we go to you, just um, does does anyone like consume any YouTube content on Svelte creators? I 
So there's a, this guy called uh, Joy of Code, Mattia, uh, I think the guy's name is, and he's done some really interesting stuff with, I think he's got a package called Remotion, and um, there's some there's some bits in there where he's like directly manipulating SVGs, and um, I think it's like really flexible, so you can do stuff with that if you need to know that. So sorry, I'll just go over here and hand the microphone over. Sure. Thank you. Great job. Uh, one thing, well, I, uh, I used Remotion a while ago, and one thing that we can then do is use uh, CSS animations. Uh, is it something the same with uh, Svelte animations? I mean, you, you have to use... Uh, that uh, is, yeah, so um, that's, let me take that. Just, I will record this. Am I speaking to this? Yeah, yeah, okay. Are. So, hello, people mm -hmm. on the internet. Um, that is, yeah, that is the one thing it can't do. In fact, there's a comment somewhere in that, like, annotated uh, source code. Um, so the CSS animations don't hook into the JavaScript clock. So when you pause the JavaScript clock, they just keep going. What you could do hypothetically, again, if you hated yourself a bit, is use, like, CSS variables possibly to kind of adjust at what point your CSS animation is. Um, and then set those CSS variables from JavaScript, and the CSS will pick up those variables and adjust off that. Um, it would probably kind of work, although I'm not sure how you'd go about staggering a CSS animation specifically with the use of CSS variables. Uh, but also, given performance isn't a major issue because you're rendering individual frames anyway, I don't think you're losing much, like doing it through JavaScript directly. Uh, you normally wouldn't because performance is horrible and, and like CSS is geared towards getting animations right. Uh, but if you're rendering frame by frame, you don't really have that performance level issue. If you were really serious about it, you could do more fast. There's the new Houdini stuff as yeah. well. And Maybe. I was just thinking you can control the CSS in like a um, for the custom actions. You have access to the mode and you can and you have tap out into the CSS there and decide exactly. what you know, there's rate, what the animation to play out. And it's like on the top of Google Blogs, there's just some you can do. I like you can set property that there's some CSS tags, which is very clever, but I Yes, yeah, so I can have a dig around the market and find it. So I think, I think there's a bit where you control it. I'm not sure how much use it would be to you. Um, we're just having a chit chat. Sorry, anyone else got any questions? He's like, I'll go to the back. Have slump. Yes, Paul. Take a break. Quickly. Uh, that looks amazing. Really good work. Um, I just wondered, with the React library that you looked at, that you were obviously heavily inspired by, uh, did you look at, like, I am guessing you did look at how they did things, and, like, obviously you went down the route of doing things with Playwright and that kind of stuff. What was that journey like in terms of, like, being like, oh, that's how they've done things, and how close did you go with what they had, or were you a bit like, mm, that's one way, but my way is going to be completely different, it's more stealthy, or what was that process? I'll pass the mic back. I don't know just realized I thought I saved myself time by going, <laughs> by going back and then I've just realized I've got a question next so he's back again. I, don't <laughs> I could just walk there as well it's just that I won't show up dancing around and we want that um, so I did like to be honest for some of the solutions to the problems I hit like especially the hashing and kind of getting the thing to look the same every frame that is directly lifted from remotion I looked like the previous version of this had um, their hashing algorithm titled as implemented by remotion but then I found that this algorithm is slightly better for varying degrees of better um, so a lot of, of how they solve the problem of how do we get the browser to spit out video, um, I think very similar. They are using headless browsers as well, like it's all headless Chrome, I think. I'm not sure. I imagine, I'm reasonably sure they have something slightly more sophisticated put together regarding actually spinning up the browsers because, again, you can do it uh, cloud-based, uh, whereas I just threw it into Playwright and kicked it until it spat out frames. Um, 
I don't think I don't think there's anything apart from actually using Svelte that I've handled in a particularly different way, except, you know, things like tweens in built into Svelte. Um what else does Svelte do? Like mostly the yeah, it's mostly the Svelte stuff. Like the initial question was how can I do exactly this but not have to write React? Um, so that, yeah, that's how I approached it. This is this is good, James. I watch you here, James. So I noticed using Windows. Never mind. Um, my question was, um, when I watched your playwright very slowly spitting out frame by frame because wind takes very slow. Um, I was thinking like, I guess it's using Chrome, right? It is. So what if you used um, like JS DOM or some other kind of kind of non-browser? Um, I guess it's headless Chrome, but something like JS DOM, which is arguably sometimes faster than, even though it's less feature supporting. Have you tried it? Have you seen what your video looked like? And uh, yeah, what's the speed difference? JS DOM is faster, but should I, I'm, a, oh, dang it. Uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm still here. Um, when <coughs> JS DOM is faster, but it's mostly faster because it doesn't actually render any of the UI. JS, you don't see anything with JS DOM. It's all faking the like the way that it's smaller, faster, and lighter is that they just throw out all the rendering stuff, which is the hard part. It just writes the DOM tree, right? Which is why. It, yeah, it just prints out the DOM tree, which is useful for testing if elements and things are there, but it's why it's actually a bit of a problem. Like it's one of the drawbacks of doing testing with JS DOM is that you never see what it looks like you and the positions of things. No, nothing. Like you can test that the CSS that you've added to your element is the right text, but right. like you can't do visual diff testing no with JS DOM because there's there's no actual okay. Visual points. You could do exactly the same thing, but with like Firefox. With um, I don't know why I picked Chrome. But... Probably the fastest, to be honest. Headless Chrome. So I think it was either. You need something to actually run in GPU. So that would be your your like if you're using WebGL, let's push it to GPU. If you're doing um, like most of the the visual stuff, the browsers themselves offload to the GPU, so you can generally leave that up to them. Um, what about canvas and screenshots in the canvas or exporting the canvas data? Actually, yeah, wrote to the canvas instead. Could yeah, but that's it. But then it's not HTML. And I all the things, things I saw were in HTML, right? But right? mm -hmm. JavaScript in the canvas. But you could still do that. So you could still load up canvas, put stuff on canvas, and the same. Just again, think frankly, spell doesn't work in canvas. Aha! Uh -huh. Like I, I yeah. wanted to avoid <laughs> learning too much. I wanted to avoid learning a new technology, so instead I wrote one, which is not a solution <laughs> retrospectively. <laughs> so what if we start an object? Thanks. That's good. Um, slightly related. Um, was the choice of Svelte because it gave you an easy way to build a UI that you could you know, road test your animation? And in terms of the project structure, and obviously I'll go and have a look myself, but these, the scenes are part of the project itself. So if I wanted to do my stuff, I would fork your repo, I'd do my own stuff. And do you have any interest whatsoever in making it slightly more modular so that you could have it as a library that you could point to a bunch of, bunch of scenes in a different project that was spelled parrot? Yes. Good. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, um, basically, so for the first bit, Svelte, yes, I have actually built other kind of interactive UIs, um, animation-based UI with Svelte. Um, I do quite a bit of, uh, like, generative SVG stuff. And again, instead of manually writing DOM code to tweak SVGs, you just plonk them on the Svelte component. It's, um, it's fully declarative, and you get the tweens, and you can easily generate variations of SVGs. So this was kind of a natural progression from that in that um, it's super easy to generate relatively complex artwork with SVG through Svelte rather than either writing it myself or I had done some stuff with React, but 
it was quite complex and it slowed to a crawl when I needed it to animate it or when I needed to um, do variations of it. So Svelte was, um, I've already done SVGs and, and shapes and design, designy stuff in Svelte. Um, I know it's good from performance level and I like it more than I like writing React. So kind of it ticked those boxes for me. Uh, regarding making it more consumable, I don't think it's too hard, honestly. So all, like, act, the stuff I'm actually doing is pretty simple. There's like those eight little chunks of code. They're just hack here, hack here, little bit of possibly slightly nifty idea and lifted from somewhere else here. Um, and it is basically just a Svelte Git project. Um, so it wouldn't be too tricky to either generate or create kind of a create app instance that builds off of Svelte or a separate NPM library that you could pull into your own Svelte kit. There's nothing that's changed from uh, the Svelte kit configuration itself, except Vite by default does not let you import stuff that's outside your source folder. Um, and I decided literally for this demo, I'd have the assets and the scenes at the top of There is config for it, but for some reason in my first project, it didn't show me the error, which is adjust this config. So I wasted two hours of Sunday evening trying to find out that this thing wasn't loading. Um, and then I spun up a completely separate project and tried to do the exact same thing. And lo and behold, the error popped up, adjust this config. And then I went to sleep. Um, but yeah, it's all, there's nothing that's out of the ordinary from, from the core of Svelte uh, kit config. Means we can migrate it to Svelte 5 in a couple of months. It's amazing. <laughs> Sweet. All right, talk to the hand. No more questions. So I guess we're going to stop recording. Nicholas, have you got any closing words? I uh, do. Yeah. Um, okay. Do I stop recording? I suppose you have a good Don't want people to hear me. Put in my Windows laptop now. <laughs> 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 Mm. Uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for you know the great talks that we had today. Um, I just want to say quickly, the next meetup for Svelte Society is also here on the 20th of March. So if you know anybody or you know would like to invite more friends, feel free to do so. You have you can see plenty of space. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talks. I hope you enjoyed the space. If you have any comments about any any parts of the whole event. To let us know on WhatsApp, um, and this is the guy that you need to speak to if you want to link to the WhatsApp. <laughs>